All right. Hello. Uh, I'm Brent Halpern, the Scientific Director of AI Horizons Network, and this is our weekly uh, AI HN seminar series. Today, we have um, Jungo Kasai from uh, University of Washington talking about low resonance, low resource, deep entity resolution with transfer and active learning. Sorry about that. Uh, Jungo is a PhD student at um, in CSE at the University of Washington, advised by Noah Smith, and he works at, um, in natural language processing, machine learning, and this is from uh, ACL 2019. So, Junko, take it away. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Okay, so I'm presenting Low Resource Deep Entity Resolution with Transfer and Access Learning today. Um, I originally presented this work at ACL 2019 in Florence. And I conducted this research while I was an intern at IBM Research Almaden last summer. And this is joint work with Kun, Saram, Yung Yao, and Lu Xin from the IBM Research Almaden. Okay. So here's the contribution of our work. We propose a deep learning based entity resolution model that allows for easy transfer learning from high resource to low resource scenarios. And we also establish an active learning algorithm to further adapt the transfer model to the target scenario. And lastly, we provide um, extensive empirical evaluations over benchmark data sets and demonstrate that our system achieves state-of-the-art performance while using um, only an order of magnitude field labels. Okay. So first background and introduction about entity resolution. So roughly speaking, entity resolution, or ER, is the task of identifying different representations of the same real-world entities across different databases. Um, so, for example, we have citation records in the ACM database, and we also have citation records in the Semantic Scholar database, and we want to find which record in ACM corresponds to which record in Semantic Scholar. Okay. Now, here's another example. We have Twitter users and Facebook accounts in the world, and we want to know which Twitter user corresponds to which Facebook user. Um, and why do we want to do this? Applications of entity resolution include knowledge base creation, text mining, social media analysis. And also ironically, entity resolution or ER is also called in many different, uh, many different ways in literature, such as um, record linkage, merge purge, and entity matching. Uh, but uh, the fundamental problem behind these uh, problems is pretty much the same. Okay, so well, you might think ER can be simply done by just looking at string similarities. Um, however, it turns out the world is very complicated. Uh, there are many traditional challenging, well, several challenges in entity resolution. First, um, we have name ambiguity, such as Michael Jordan in basketball and Michael Jordan in machine learning. Um, and it, this is very challenging, for example, when you um, disambiguate uh, Chinese names in science papers, uh, because there's many overlaps. Um, there are other problems like data, data entry, um, data entry errors, missing values, and abbreviations. And we have to know, for example, ACL stands for Association for Computational Linguistics when we deal with uh, scientific papers, not Austin City Limits, et cetera. And in fact, if you're an NLP researcher, you know the pain of um, Googling ACL or looking up ACL in any uh, search engines. Um, we always get these different entities like the Music Festival and the Soccer League, um, and we have yet to solve this problem by entity resolution when we do um, uh, entity lookups. Okay, so in literature, there are two major strands of models for entity resolution. One is rule-based systems, and the other one is learning-based models. And in the rule-based systems, we define similarity functions between strings um, to make matching decisions of entity representations. And on the other hand, learning-based methods train statistical models on the training data, such as SVM and decision tree, and apply it to any um, evaluation data you want to use your entity resolution models for. Okay, so in this work, we focus on the machine learning-based approaches. Uh, in particular, we focus on recent deep learning-based solutions. So these models have the benefit of avoiding the need for defining features for every single entity resolution scenario unlike other machine learning based methods uh, because we use distributed representations um, instead of feature engineering. However, uh, de deep learning based models require many labeled examples to perform outperform other learning algorithms such as SVM and naive base. 
uh, as you can see in this plot, only after we get enough labels does the deep learning based method plotted in blue here um, outperform the others. So to address this issue of data hungriness, um, this work establishes a novel framework for lower resource data density optimization. So now before discussing our approaches, we formalize the problem of answer resolution. So given two sets of data record collections from two databases, D1 and D2, we classify each pair, E1 and E2, in the Cartesian product, D1 cross D2, into matches and no matches. Chord D1 and E2 is represented as a tuple with attributes, as, as you can see in this table. Uh, so in the, in the case of citations, we have several attributes, such as author, title, and year. And using these inputs, we want to identify the same entities across databases. And those two databases, D1 and D2, can be the same single database, in which case we have the special case of entity resolution, which is called duplicate detection within a single database. Now, conventionally, we solve this problem of entity resolution by two steps. The first step is called blocking, uh, where we reduce the Cartesian product by filtering out obvious mismatches, uh, because the uh, Cartesian product is too huge and we want to make it tractable. And for example, we can eliminate tuple pairs um, of papers that have different ER attributes. And the second step is called matching, where we classify the remaining pairs in the candidate set after blocking to identify actual matches. And our work focuses on this matching step and fix the blocking strategy in each ER scenario, regardless of the methods we use. To, so this ensures that we make fair comparisons across different matching methods, because we use the same blocking strategy regardless of the method. Now, our framework for low resource deep entity resolution consists of two orthogonal approaches. The first one is transfer learning, where we develop a deep learning model that allows for transfer learning from a source scenario to a target scenario that has no labeled data. So we can simply train a deep learning entity resolution model on the source data set and then use the same network parameters for the target scenario. And active learning, uh, the target scenario, labeling a small number of informative, informative samples. Now we first present our transfer learning. So we take a similar deep learning architecture to Moodle and others 2018 to compare pairing the candidate set after blocking. So for example, tuple A comes from DBLP and tuple B comes from Google Scholar. And we want to compare those tuples across these two databases, DBLP and Google Scholar. So for each attribute, such as the author attribute, we, conduct, uh, we, we construct vector representations by using bidirectional uh, GRUs on top of the FASTX pre-trained vectors. And the FASTX vectors are obtained from subword representations, which is particularly important to address the problem of out of vocabulary uh, problem that appears frequently in databases such as proper, proper nouns and technical terms in these databases, right? So for instance, we get vector representations for Alan Turing um, for tuple A, and we also get uh, a vector representation for tu um, Turing Alan M for tuple B by the same bidirectional GRUs. And these representations are reflective of subword information, so we, we can make sure that um, these words are, even if they are out of vocabulary, we get proper vector representations. Now, once we get attribute vectors, uh, we compare the two tuples by taking the absolute difference between these two vectors. Uh, we make these comparisons across all attributes, not just the author, such as title and year in, uh, in the example of citation genera. And once we get those vectors, we add those similarity vectors to represent the overall similarity between the two tuples. And this addition operation is critical because it ensures that dimension, the final dimension, is the same regardless of the number of attributes that we have in the scenario. And this allows us to transfer the network parameters between scenarios that have different numbers of attributes. So for example, Google Scholar has four attributes, while the Quora scenario has eight attributes, such as the publisher name, in addition to author names and year. Um, but we can still transfer all network parameters between these two scenarios. 
without any modifications in terms of the architecture. So finally, we pass this uh, similarity vector to the feed forward matching classifier and predict a match or no match. And we can train this network by simply maximizing the uh, log likelihood of the label train thing. Um, now we can apply the domain adaptation technique for transfer learning from computer vision literature in addition to these uh, simple uh, building blocks. So in particular, in, in addition to the matching classifier, we pass this vector to the feed forward domain classifier as well. Uh, and importantly, we create a gradient reversal layer between the domain network. And this ensures that the domain classifier is trained to distinguish the source and the target scenarios, while the rest of the network is trying to fool the classifier, meaning that it is encouraged to develop domain-dependent representations, which are useful for transfer purposes because they don't distinguish between uh, different scenarios. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, in the previous slide, um, you assume that the attributes in the two databases have been already matched in the previous one? In, yes, that's right, yeah. Okay. So in every scenario, you have to do sort of schema matching, right? You're right. Mm -hmm. But the target scenario could have different schema uh, results, right? Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Okay, so, um, right, so good. Uh, so now we present our transfer learning results. Here we assume we have no target labels. So we can see that by adding the domain adaptation technique, we generally improve transfer learning performance on the target, on the target databases, DBLP ACM, DBLP Scholar, and Quora. However, there's still a huge gap between the transfer learning results and the results we get by training the network with all target labels. Okay, so remember that the transfer learning results, we don't assume any target labels. Now, this motivates us to explore active learning as a method to further refine the transfer model, to close the gap between these, uh, well, the high resource scenario and the low resource scenario. So we present active learning. Again, active learning further refines the transfer model by iteratively labeling informative examples from the target. But there are two major issues to achieve this goal. The first problem is that we need substantial labeled examples to tune the transfer deep learning model without overfitting to the subset of the labels. Now, the second problem is specific to the problem with entry resolution, which is since the distribution of entry resolution labels is skewed toward the negative or no matches, it is hard to find false negatives and to improve the recall of the system. Because, of course, we have way more no matches than matches uh, when you compare different databases, even after blocking. And in order to address this, these issues, we propose an entity, well, entropy based sampling method. So let H of X be the entropy of the prediction on the input X given by the current model. Then, on certain examples of size K, can be defined as a set of pairs with top K entropies. We can manually label those uncertain and therefore informative examples for the model. And we can tune the current model to these new examples and repeat this process iteratively. So this is sort of the most naive way of doing active learning for entry resolution. However, the two problems we just mentioned still remain. So again, we need substantial labeled examples to, tune the trans, uh, to the transfer network parameters that manual labeling does not scale, right? And this tuning method will suffer a recall because, we, because of the nature of entry resolution labels. Now, in contrast to uncertain examples, we can also define high confidence examples as a set of pairs with bottom K entropies. And we can manually label uncertain and therefore informative examples while automatically label those high confidence samples by model prediction as a proxy. Now we can then tune the model to these examples and this, uh, repeat this process iteratively. So this, uh, this solves the problem, uh, the first problem we just discussed, by adding high confidence samples with labels as a, with auto automatic labels as a proxy. We can avoid overfitting only to manually labeled examples. 
But again, problem two is supersist. Such tuning will lead to a model with low results or low recall because the entry resolution example is skewed toward a negative or no matches. So in order to solve this problem, we further subdivide high confidence and uncertain examples by the current model predictions. So in particular, we define high confidence positives, high confidence negatives, um, uncertain positives, and uncertain negatives using entropy and the current model predictions. So these four classes correspond to likely true positives, likely true negatives, and likely false positives, and likely false negatives. Right? For example, pairs that have high entropy and are classified as positive by the current model are likely false positives. Does that make sense? Okay. So we sample these four classes of pairs we just defined equally, right, and tune our model to the sampled examples. So we later show that this sampling strategy with partitioning with respect to the four classes actually helps, helps our active learning um, substantially. So now we present our results. Now, we focus on the citation genre here because we have extensive benchmark data sets. So the x-axis here indicates the number of examples we manually labeled, and the y-axis indicates the uh, F1 score of the system on the, the same evaluation data. Now we see that deep entry resolution model, we transfer an active learning, which is plotted in blue here, achieves the best performance with faster convergence as compared to the other machine learning based methods, and also the vanilla uh, deep learning method plotted in red here. And again, we see that deep learning model is data hungry um, and underperforms SVM under this low resource setting where we only have 1,000 labeled examples for the target. However, uh, by adding active learning, we significantly outperform SVM. And in particular, the combination of transfer and active learning um, yields the best performance. The active learning alone already yields uh, a performance better than SVM and other machine learning algorithms we tried in the paper. But when, you, when we combine transfer and active learning together, this yields the best performance. Now, you might say that SVM can also perform much better than this by incorporating some sort of active learning. Well, there are many active learning methods in literature for SVM, but our results show that deep entry resolution with transfer and active learning even outperforms SVM with full training data. Right? So this suggests that deep entry resolution model with transfer and active learning is strictly better than the performance, uh, well, better than the SVM performance since the performance with the full bit labeled training data can serve as an up, sort of an upper bound. So the same patterns hold for, hold for other scenarios, such as the core citation data set, and we see a significant performance gain by transfer and active learning. Uh, we also test our models on other generalized citations. In the restaurant genre, we again see that transfer learning alone doesn't suffice to yield a reliable system, but when combined with active learning, we get state of the art performance. Now in the software, uh, software genera, we again see that deep learning with active learning plotted in blue here achieves the best, uh, the best performance in a low resource setting. And we can see, you can see more results in other genera in our paper. So now we want to give an analysis on our approach. We presented several approaches and we want to know uh, whether, how, how effective these approaches were. So the question, is how important was our sampling strategy in active learning. So we compare different sampling strategies here, and the first strategy is to just to take top K entropy pairs and annotate them in each iteration manually and tune the model to these manually enabled examples. So if we partition these manually labeled uncertain examples, into likely false positives and likely false negatives. And instead of just sampling them, we can equally sample them from these two classes, right? And then by doing this partitioning, we get a performance boost. So specifically, we see that recall improves dramatically while keeping the high precision. So by combining both partitioning and high confidence sampling, or high confidence automatic labeling, we just discussed, 
we get the best performance, both in terms of precision and recall. And this means that uh, in addition to the partition mechanism we just introduced, the automatic labeling also helps the deep learning model to tune better without overfitting. So we can also look at the actual breakdown of the manual, uh, manually labeled samples using the uh, gold labels. So when we do experiments, we don't assume any gold labels, but when we look at, when, when we give an analysis, we can use the gold labels. So partition indeed helps us find more balanced samples here. Uh, but interestingly, we sample more true positives. So uh, ideally, we want to find, um, we want to find false negatives and false positives here. But here, by, uh, by doing this partitioning mechanism, we sample more true positives because we aggressively choose likely false negatives. But again, these false negatives are generally challenged to find uh, because of the nature of entry pollution where the labels are skewed toward the negative or mismatches. So in conclusion, um, our deep entry resolution model yields competitive performance to state of the art while using an order of magnitude fewer labels. Uh, we also saw that transfer learning alone doesn't suffice to construct a reliable entry resolution system, but when combined with active learning, we get stable and high performance. And this work provides further support for the claim that deep learning can provide a unified integration method even in low resource settings without the need for feature engineering for every single year scenario we have. And for future work, we are interested in applying our methods to more complicated scenarios, genres, and also no English languages. And we are also interested in applying the transfer and active, active learning frameworks uh, to more problems than the uh, answer solution. So lastly, we thank Sid Murugal, Vamsi Mendry, and Phoebe Molkir for their help with this work. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you very much. Um, if you want to ask a question, please unmute yourself. Um, There's a little red microphone icon at the bottom of your screen. And I see Hamid's already um, unmuted. Yeah. So, Hamid, you want to start? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, do you have, so can you use also this active learning method for fusing the entities? So, so far you connected them, you matched them, but then now I have to fuse them, right? You know, to take like attributes from different places that are similar and combine them. And uh, if that's a manual process, it's very, very expensive. So can you use the active learning with your sampling to reduce the cost there? Uh, can, can I use sampling uh, active learning to do, sorry, schema matching your question? Uh, no, no, the fusion part. So all you did was the linking, right? But at the end, I have to combine the attribute values from different places, and they are similar as well, and I combine them into one result. Yes, yeah. So the results, so, they are con connected. Got it. Um, so in this work, we haven't tried it. Um, we use the benchmark data sets that already uh, that have already done like the fusion process you just mentioned, but in principle, yeah, we should be able to do um, active learning for uh, not just the linking part, but also the fusion part, yes. Um, but in reality, it's sometimes challenging uh, because there's uh, different types, of, so you have to tune the model well, And uh, but yeah, it's a, that's an interesting question. Okay, but you haven't done it really. So we haven't done it, yes. Yeah. Any any other questions? Please unmute yourself. Okay, I have one. Um, so you were you were matching across two publication databases. Yeah. Is there a sensitivity that those are going to be? I mean, you talked about schema mapping, and you got to do some, but those are two relatively similar uh, data sources. If you did publications and resumes I mean the same information is there is it just going to be is it going to be just like two publication databases or is the heterogeneity going to maybe trip uh, something yeah. Out? yeah that's a great question so, um, so one of the actual advantages of the uh, these deep learning methods is you don't have to do feature engineering um, well you have to do you have to tune the model but well hi hyper you know tune the hyperparameters but you don't have to find uh, different features for different scenarios. So we hope that 
this method will work better um, when it comes to sort of more textual data. So actually there's some prior work that showed that deep learning methods uh, perform other learning-based methods substantially uh, when they uh, work on sort of textual data. So instead of having these relatively strict sort of relatively structured data like titles and year and authors, we can have more textual data like product descriptions that can be a little, that can be messy, that can be messier. Um, and we, we think that this method would work, scale better to these um, highly textual data uh, and relatively unstructured data. Um, but that's sort of future, uh, uh, future work. And uh, we are sort of lacking um, nice uh, sort of empirical, well, benchmark data sets right now, but uh, it would be great if we can try on sort of even private data, uh, if we can try that. So I got another question for you, Samir. Yep. Okay, so did you consider any kind of confidence score as a figure of the sources? So for example, say Google Scholar confidence is 80% and GDPL is uh, 40 um, uh, So did I use uh, confidence scores to do uh, for active learning or? No, no, for the matching part. For the matching part. So we didn't, I see. Um, so we only, yeah, we trained this model on the uh, negative log likelihood. So that's sort of the, the only place where this uh, probability came in, um, in the matching part. Um, in the active learning part, we also looked at the confidence levels and, and, and uh, uncertain examples, but we are not making use of uh, confidence scores. Yeah, so in active learning part, that influences your sampling, or, or you say the expert going to look at you know, high confidence versus low confidence and just make a judgment? Right, right. No, is it, is it like automated or? It's know? automated, right. So we use these, uh, so you, we have this transferred model, and the transfer model gives you the scores on the label, well, sorry, on the pairs that we, we don't have any labels for. Um, so it's automatic. It's completely automatic. Now we can also look at the correlation between actual human human annotations. So humans can also give some confidence scores, and we can also compare that with model predictions. That would be interesting. Um, maybe in some cases um, it's very easy for them uh, for the deep learning model, but it's very hard for humans or something like that. Uh, but we haven't done it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? If not, Jungle, thank you very much for the for the very cool presentation and the good slides. Um, uh, there will not be a seminar next week because we have the AI Horizons uh, AI Horizons Network as part of AI Research Week in Cambridge. Um, we hope to continue the week after that. Um, we're going to try to include also talks about data sets and tools that can be shared in, with our colleagues in the universities. So um, stay tuned, and we'll have an announcement out hopefully soon for the next seminar. Thank you. Great, thank you.